I have a question for all the post-trib rapture holders out there. So we go to Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus is speaking to Peter, and he is saying that on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So clearly Peter tells Jesus that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church. But we go to Revelation 13, 7, where we see it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, to prevail against them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So was Jesus lying in Matthew 16, verse 18, that the gates of Hades would never prevail against the church, but now in the tribulation, because according to you, the church is going through the tribulation, the Antichrist and the gates of Hades overcome the church, the saints, according to your belief. What's going on? What's going on there? Did Jesus lie? How do you answer that? How do you reconcile Matthew 16, 18, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Revelation 13, 7, the Antichrist overcomes, prevails against the saints. Now, I personally believe the saints found in Revelation 13, 7 are the tribulation saints who are saved after the rapture, the removal of the restrainer, the removal of the church. Addition to that question, I have another question. So we see in Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, speaking about Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Focus in on provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the church goes through the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, the tribulation, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. Jacob turned into Israel, but he shall be saved out of it. How would the church going through Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble, but Israel's trouble, how would us going through the tribulation provoke them to jealousy? Or would maybe a pre-tribulation rapture that catches away, snatches away the bride of Christ, those who have believed in the Jewish Messiah, maybe that's what provokes the Jews because now they need to go through their trouble, Jacob's trouble. For the tribulation has a purpose, and the purpose is to bring unbelieving Israel back in to belief. And if the church is still there, what is Israel going to be jealous about? And if the church is going through the tribulation, what's the need for the 144,000 believing Jews to preach the gospel? You would have the church that could do that. But since the church won't be there, the 144,000 is necessary to get the gospel out. And also, why is Jesus preparing a place for us in heaven, John chapter 14, if the post-tribulation rapture happens, we go up in the clouds and come back immediately to rule and reign down here for the millennial kingdom. So why was he preparing places in heaven for us? Maybe it's because he's preparing places for us in heaven to spend seven years up there where we're not supposed to be forever because we come back down with him, Revelation 19, on our white horses to then go into the millennial kingdom down here. Also, why are the Thessalonians shaken and in fear when they got the false letter thinking it was from Paul, telling them that they are going through the tribulation. For wouldn't they be happy if they believed in the post-tribulation rapture because they now know they are going through the tribulation and Jesus will be back soon. They can know, but they're not happy. They are in fear and shaken because they thought they missed their rapture because that's what Paul told them about before. And now they get this new letter and they're shaken thinking they missed the rapture. And that's why Paul has to remind them, do you not remember I told you these things? First, this needs to happen. And you're not going to be here because the restrainer will be removed. The apostasia, which is the defaction, spiritual defaction, which is the rapture. The Holy Spirit will defect, will go away using the church as the restrainer. And then the Antichrist shall rise. You're not going to be here for that. Stop being scared. Do you not remember what I told you? Again, logically. If the Thessalonians believed in a post-trib rapture, why would they be scared if they were going through the tribulation? They would be happy because they're going to see their Messiah soon. But no, 
They did not believe in a post-trib rapture. They believed in the blessed hope. On top of that, Paul tells us, comfort one another with these words. How is that comforting to know that you are going to go through hell on earth? There's going to be scorpions stinging each other, everybody. There's going to be earthquakes, tornadoes. All hell is going to break loose. Evil will go off the chain. How are you going to comfort each other with these words? You know, okay, well, it's going to be hell on earth. Evil is going to be just off the chain. Um, there's going to be murder. There's going to be rape. There's going to be destruction beyond all belief. But hey, you know what? Be encouraged and comfort each other with these words. Or if you think it's bad and lawless right now, wait until every Christian is removed. Right now, the Holy Spirit through the church is the restrainer keeping the lawlessness back from overflowing. It's like a dam. It's like the Hoover Dam. The church is the Hoover Dam and the water is the evil. Right now, evil is just piling on and the church is restraining it through the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit is restraining it through the church. Imagine the lawlessness once we are gone. Also, you have Paul telling us that we are not appointed to God's wrath. And I know there is the mid-trib pre-wrath holders out there. The first seal that Jesus breaks is his wrath. He is implementing it. He is breaking the seal and pouring out his wrath through that breaking of the seal. The entire seven-year tribulation is God's wrath, and we are not appointed to it. Not to mention, don't you think the bridegroom would want his bride up there to see him in all his glory when he breaks the seals and pours out judgment upon an unbelieving world? Or no, he's going to be a wife beater. He's going to pour out his judgment and his wrath upon his bride, the church. I don't think so. We are going to be up there praising him. We're going to be up there glorifying him, watching our redeemer, our king, who we are now his bride, pour out judgment upon an unbelieving world. You better believe our Messiah is not a wife beater. And also please answer to me, Revelation 3.10, where he Jesus literally tells the Philadelphia church, I will keep you from that hour of trial that is going to come upon the earth to keep you, to receive you, to catch you up. It's more insane to think that that interpretation is, oh, well, believers will be protected here in the world from the evil. What? That's more, that's more logical and easier to think about than just being caught up in the air and being with him in heaven, which there's so much so much evidence to prove that. No, it makes more sense to think that he's going to supernaturally protect every single Christian here when all hell on earth is breaking out. And don't get me started on all the typologies, Noah and the ark, Elijah, Enoch, Lot. You have typologies everywhere in the Bible, everywhere. The truth is the pre-tribulation rapture. If you don't want to believe it, that's fine. It's not a salvation issue, but I'm telling you what, the joy and the peace that comes from it because it is our blessed hope. We are supposed to use this to encourage one another and to help comfort one another. There is a purpose for it. And with that, I love you guys all so much, no matter what you believe. And go ahead and tag your friends and family who believe in the post-trib rapture on this video. God bless, guys.